So a question that I get quite a bit is, do we have to decrypt an application in order to troubleshoot it? Especially as more and more applications are becoming encrypted over the wire, the myth is, is that Wireshark and packet analysis aren't really useful. After all, you can't see the data, so how can you troubleshoot? Well, nothing can be farther from the truth. In fact, in this video, I wanna show you some of the things that I do when I need to troubleshoot an encrypted application, but I don't have the ability to decrypt it. Wireshark and using the packets on the wire can still give you a lot of data, so don't discount what you can actually still see. Now, one thing to consider before we dive into the packets is whether that application is using TCP or if it's using Quick, which runs over UDP. So for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna walk you through an example that's over TCP, because there's quite a bit more that we can still see on the wire. For Quick, we'll go ahead and handle that in another video. If you wanna follow along with me, go ahead and click the link in the description down below. You can go to my GitHub and then you can download this PCAP and follow right along with me. So let's get to it. So what are some of the things that I first do when I'm looking at a PCAP that's encrypted? Well, first of all, if I just take a look at the TCP handshake. Now, I've said this in video after video, how important it is to capture the TCP handshake and how much we can learn about our endpoints from it. So let's go ahead and take a look, closer look here. I'm just gonna simplify some of the columns here in my profile. Uh, I'm just going to remove our sequence and acknowledgement numbers just for now, and just to simplify this just a little bit uh, so we're all on the same packet page. Uh, one thing you might notice that might be different from the screen you're looking at to the one that I am using right now, I don't like to use frame length for doing my packet analysis when I'm in TCP flows. For me, preference, I like to use TCP length. Just to show you how you can do that real quick, click, click packet one, and I'm going to go down to the TCP header, expand that, and if you come down to TCP segment length, you can grab that field and drag it drop it and let go up to the column headers and that will allow you to see the amount of data that is actually encompassed. So this is going to be the TCP payload length. Notice in the handshake, those are zeros. That's because there's no data contained, there's no payload. Uh, this is just TCP overhead, TCP setting it up and doing its thing for the connection. All right, so what are some things that I look for in an encrypted packet trace? So first of all, like I said, the handshake. So here's my SYN going out from client to server. Right away, I know which one's the client, which one's the server. Clients typically start connections. They send SYNs. So I know 4.23 is my client. If I come over here, I can see the destination 443 port. I know that uh, this 172.67 box is my server. Okay, great. So I send my SYN out, SYN act comes back. I'm over here on my Delta time. Now I've shown you in other videos, you can click this one just up here if you'd like to see how to set up that Delta time column. Uh, but basically this is the amount of time between packets. So SYN goes out, SYN out comes back, and that's a measurement of my network round trip time. Now I can also tell from this data right here that I am capturing client side. The bulk of the delay in the TCP handshake is between the SYN and the SYN ACK. So 14, point, 14 and a half milliseconds here. And then 310 microseconds later, the client lets go of the final ACK in the TCP handshake. All right, so my network round trip time, 14 milliseconds. Just gives me a good ballpark number to work with. In fact, Wireshark also thinks that's an, an important number, an important value to be aware of. Because if we go down to the TCP header, and if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, you can see IRTT, I'm on packet number three, uh, that's initial round trip time. So that's the network round trip time in the header or the, the TCB handshake. Okay, great. So I have that data. That gives me a little context. I know that I'm capturing client side. I know which is client, which is server. I know what ports I'm using. Uh, if I want to get into the TCP weeds, I can also take a look at the TCP options. Uh, just, just to peek at this, I can see I've got MSS, window scale, timestamp, SAC. And if I look at the SYNAC coming back, the server supports uh, this MSS, SAC permitted, window scaling. Just gives me a bit of context of what the capabilities of the TCP connection are going to be. More on that in some other videos that I cover with TCP fundamentals. I just linked one of them up here. In the, uh, you can click on that up there. So once the TCP connection is established, the next thing that I can get still out of an, an encrypted conversation is the beginning of the TLS handshake. So the first thing, the client hello is gonna go off. That's gonna go from client to server. This is the client offering some options to the server and also beginning that initiation of the TLS handshake. Taking a look at that, packet number four, 
so I can see uh, that Wireshark gives me that SNI, the server name indicator. This is the server that I want to talk to, wireshark.org. Uh, also some other TLS stuff that's sent over. If I open up TLS in this TLS record, I can also see the versions that the client supports, the ALPN, so what's the uh, application that the, uh, the client is capable of supporting, and what server name do I want to talk to. Uh, the server turns around and hits, hits me back. This is just an empty TCP ACK, so this isn't an actual TLS response, but just TCP saying, great, I got that client, hello. That took 11 milliseconds. So right there, I can see that that took three milliseconds less than the initial handshake did. So that's good. Things got just a touch faster there. And again, this is all just ballpark. Just lets me know, it gives me a context of what the latency is between client and server. Four milliseconds later, server hello comes back. So now the server, it's going to select a TLS version. It's going to select a cipher suite. It's going to send that uh, session ID and uh, some other information. This is where we start to go encrypted. Okay, so from this point forward, typically in Wireshark, unless you have the decryption keys, uh, from this point forward, you're just going to see just TLS uh, version 1.3, 1.2, whatever you're using, and your uh, loaded packets. Uh, right here, so that's what we got. But notice that I still have some pretty useful TCP indicators that can help me when I'm troubleshooting specifically performance problems. Um, some other connectivity issues could still be, uh, we can still troubleshoot that way, but uh, just to focus on more performance side of things, uh, what I want to do is I want to start looking with my eyes for delays. Uh, where is the client waiting? Uh, what's lagging? You know, I'm a consultant. I troubleshoot problems for my clients. That's why I get called. Usually they don't call me when things are going too fast. They call me when things are going too slow. So what I've trained my eyes to do is look for delays. And right away, based on what I have upstairs in the Handshake and TLS setup, I know that my network round trip time between 11 and 14 milliseconds. So I come down here to packet 12, I know that that looks like a full network round trip. I can see another one down here, packet 20. That's a network round trip. And if I look just above that, I can see, oh, okay, client sent some thing to the server. The server's reacting to it and acknowledging it. That took a network round trip. So if I see a lot of these right here, if I see just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, then I know that I'm eating that network round trip quite a bit. Uh, what I also want to be very wary of is in packet 21. Now this is a much larger delay, wouldn't you agree? Uh, if I'm usually cranking 11 milliseconds, all of a sudden, boom, I have half a second here. Uh, so just after that as well, Wireshark is giving me a couple indicators here. I got a retransmission, I got some dupacks. So something happened here. So let's take a closer look, even without uh, decryption. Okay, so if I'm taking a look at packet number 20, uh, so client sends thing to server. Server acts. Server then reacts with this 901 bytes. That took 500 milliseconds. Kind of an interestingly perfect 500 milliseconds. Just after that, I see 31 bytes. I see 31 bytes again, and then 932, two retransmissions. Hmm. Okay, so I see this delay, this period of time. The server, it looks like the server had sent 901. Perhaps it got buffered somewhere because look at how fast these packets come in together, right? Look at packet 21 through 24. It's like they, there's almost no delay, like boom, boom, boom. Now I'm sitting client side from my perspective. So from what it looks like, all of these arrive just boom, right at the same time. But in reality, if we had a server side packet capture, we would be able to see exactly how the server let go of these packets. I will tell you this, and let me just go ahead and just look you straight in the eyes. It's a lot better when you can get both sides of the conversation when you don't have decryption. So if you're working on it, if you're working on something that you have no way of uh, getting the decryption keys for, and it's gonna stay encrypted on the wire, do yourself a favor, try your best to get both client and server for this reason. Because it really gives us a better point of visibility. You can see uh, for this 500 milliseconds that we're troubleshooting right now, uh, was that completely spent on the wire? How much was spent server side? Uh, what else was the server doing at that time? 
but there are some clues that we can still pick up even if we just have one side. In this case, we just have the client. So let's go back to our packets. Okay, so here, uh, it looks like these packets are like just bam, 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 right? So 901, and this is where, uh, let's go ahead and add in a couple of columns here. Let's just have some real fun. Go deep dive with TCP, because you know that's what we do, packet people. All right, expanding TCP, gonna go down to sequence number. Let me grab this one, just gonna drag and drop it upstairs, boom. And then I'm gonna take the act number as well, relative, both of those are relative. And I'm going to drag and drop that up there. Uh, I'm just going to move this around just a little bit. And I also, uh, while I'm up here, just want to show you a little trick. You see how much space that column header takes, sequence number, but the number itself doesn't take a lot of space. I'm, I'm a real, you know, I get real, real uh, specific when it comes to how my real estate is used, right? Usually when I'm talking to you, I'm not using my big screen over here. I'm using just this small window. Uh, so I like to maximize my real estate. Let me just right click that up there. I'm gonna go to edit column. And I'm just going to do uh, up here uh, in the top left. Uh, that's where I'm editing that sequence number. So let me just, uh, actually I can zoom in on that for you just a little bit. We're just gonna go to SEQ and then just gonna put number, hit enter. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with the act number, right click, act number, boom. Okay, cool, so coming back here. And if I go to act, there we go. All right, so. Nice. So now I got sequence and acknowledgement numbers. So now I want to come back down to that area where I had my perceived loss or it looks like retransmission. So, okay. So 901 goes 2682. That's the sequence number that we're at. So 2682 plus 901 bytes. That gives us 3583. That's the next expected sequence number that we'll start at. And so this packet starts at 3583. We're sending 31. Our next expected sequence number, add those two together, and it's actually 3614. I'm just going to cheat and look down here at the next packet coming from my client. Okay, so we send that out, and then right on its heels, just bam, bam, immediately afterward, we see exactly the same packet. TCP retransmission is what Wireshark is calling it. And then right on that packet's heels, we see 932 bytes. Starting at 2682, if you notice 2682, and this time it's 932. So this final packet 24, this is actually 901 plus 31. So what happened here? Well, just looking at the behavior, and we only have client side. It'd be great to have server side as well, but we only have uh, client side right now. It appears that the server let these two first packets go, never got the expected response, Keep in mind, it's expecting 10 milliseconds. The server knows that. So the server's like, look, I sent you that data. How come I haven't gotten an act back yet? And then it goes ahead and retransmits here. Doesn't see an acknowledgement for that one. And then back here, still haven't received an acknowledgement for that one. So uh, it does set a timer. As soon as that timer expires, it goes, you know what? I haven't seen my acknowledgement yet. I'm going to go ahead and retransmit. All the while, it appears like those two packets there may have been buffered somewhere along the way. Perhaps they were being inspected by some device along the network. That's something I'm definitely seeing more and more of these days. Devices that will do deep packet inspection along the way and they will buffer for a period of time. So this could be something that we're observing here. And just so you know while we're on this, my goal in this video is not to arrive at a conclusion with you. My goal is to show you the process and how far you can get while still working with an encrypted application. So that was just a sidebar for you. All right, back to our packets. So, uh, all right, so it appears these two packets went, server never got a response, retransmits, then retransmits. Now, how do I know that these aren't duplicate packets? Is it possible that these two 31s are just the same packet that I caught twice? Or maybe my capture method is doing something funny. Well, for this, one thing I will pink at, which is another thing you get, even with encryption, uh, if you come down to the IP ID. Now, when I send out data on the wire, I put out an IP datagram, put out an IP payload, the IP header is going to use this identification number. Now, stacks are kind of funny with how they use this. Some will randomize this number. Some within a conversation will increment this number by one for every packet they send out 
And some devices will just zero it out because they don't want to be fingerprinted. So go ahead and Google that. Just Google IP ID or I'll put out some more information for you guys on that. But anyway, it's just more information that I can get off the wire. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So packet 21, uh, IP ID 234, then 235 for packet 22, 236, 237. So these are all packets that went out one after the other from the server. What does that tell me? These aren't dupes. If this was a duplicate packet, they would have the same IP ID. I would have just captured it twice. So this tells me these are unique packets sent from the server. The server thought it's taken way too long to get this data back. Let's go ahead and retransmit it. So it looks like for me, just initially, what I would do is I'd start to look at the network. What is the network between client and server? How much of it do we own? What's the service provider? What type of link of it is, is it? And absolutely, can we get a capture from the server side to validate what our assumptions are from just seeing this from the client perspective? But right there, our half a second, we can start to get a, a bit of a view into what's going on in the wire. Now coming down here as well, I wanted to show you with packet 44, you see this other indicator here. This is a spurious retransmission. So if you look at packet 41, this was the original packet that went. Uh, it's 31 bytes that's contained in there, server to client. There's my sequence number, 15258. Right here, if we go to the next packet, this is the client acting that packet. You see packet 42 is acting packet 41. I have a visual check mark over there. That's what Wireshark is telling me. So the client is saying, okay, good, I got it. Good, I got it. In fact, packet 43, it even increased its TCP window just a little bit. And then we see the server retransmit 28 milliseconds later. So the server, it's possible, it just never got this ACK. That ACK could have been stuck along the way back. Or that packet, sometimes you just see this spurious retransmission, even though this ACK already made it back to the server. It's not ideal, but sometimes that can happen too. But what do we learn? There's a whole lot that you can still get off of the wire when you're using a TCP, <laughs> TCP, thank you, based application. There's quite a bit that we can still get. We can still see if there's network packet loss. We can track that down. If you're seeing retransmissions, dupacks, you can see, see window sizes, um, zero window issues, even congestion things along the path. You can even, in some cases, HTTP2 makes this a little harder, um, but you can still, in some cases, even deduce application response time in an encrypted application. So. Don't feel that all is lost just because an application is encrypted and you don't have the decryption keys. If you want to take a look at how to get the decryption keys, this is one way to do it. I'm going to link a video upstairs and, and show you how that can be done. Uh, but generally speaking, usually for me, most of the time I can't get that. I got to do this just with on the wire with just what I have. Now stay tuned packet people because I'm going to be putting out a bit more on how to work with encrypted applications that aren't over TCP but are over the quick protocol because that makes things a little bit more difficult. Some of the things that we saw in this video we lose. Now if you want to know what quick is and how to work with it and how it's an emerging transport protocol, go ahead and click here to learn more about quick.